Now coming to tonight's session, please allow me to welcome Sandeep Gururaj, the host of this session. Sandeep is currently the Senior Product Manager for Customer Service Product at Pegasystems. Over the last 17 years, he has had successful assignments, both internal and customer facing for different products as Pegasystems. He is a collaborative, organized and communicative team member, along with experience of leading product development teams. He aspires to be a product leader and continues to learn, mentor and grow as a part of his personal backlog. He's also an alumni at the, product leadership, uh, at, at the Institute of Product Leadership, pursuing the EMBA program in product leadership. Great to have you here with us, Sandeep. Hand your session over to you now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shama, for that introduction. Uh, greetings, everybody. Uh, once again, I welcome you all to the Product Leadership Festival uh, on behalf of IPL, Digital Product Management Edition, starting not today, but I would say that right now. I'm super excited to, of course, host this uh, first keynote session. You know, like it always takes the first one to take the courage as such. Um, as a product manager, of course, my first responsibility is to understand the customer well. You know, so before I talk about today's topic and introduce our guest speaker, I want to get to know you all a little bit. Uh, so all I wanted you to do, do is uh, please participate in a short poll. It's a very simple multiple choice questions. Um, so uh, Shama or Pratibha, if you could uh, post a link there. So you could see some uh, poll coming up on your screen and uh, uh, you could please uh, participate in this and just provide some simple responses here. And a quick mention to the viewers on LinkedIn, YouTube, Twitter, and Facebook. You have the link to the, uh, to the questions in your comment section. Please take the link, the link and it will direct you to the questions and take the poll. Of course. Thank you, Sharma, for that. So there, so while you're doing this, answering your answering the small poll, let me continue. Uh, there used to be a time, you know, when product decisions were based on uh, desires and instincts of, uh, you know, the top level bosses, uh, product managers or C-level executives as such. Uh, not anymore. I'm sure many of you would agree with this. So what is the driver of these instincts? Uh, is it customer feedbacks? Is it competitive markets? Or is it uh, digital analytics? In my view, personal view, uh, based on my experience, the answer should be all of them. In fact, all of these data sources as such. Uh, as product managers, you know, we often consider data from various different sources uh, to make data-driven decisions. Ask me why, you know, one of the questions, one of the participants uh, in one of the previous sessions asked me why. Uh, it's because data-driven product management can help us um, in to say, to use the right data um, ultimately to build the right product. It sounds easy, doesn't it? It actually isn't easy. And that's exactly the reason why we need to be uh, data informed rather than data driven. Now, Sandeep, we have the results to the uh, poll number one. Can I uh, launch the second poll? Yeah, sure. Yeah, we, ha we have, uh, you know, like a uh, good, good amount of participation there. So. That brings us to the topic of today's session. Uh, to delve more into the differences between data-driven and data-informed product management, uh, I'm excited to call upon today's guest speaker, Ingrid Bernadal. Um, let me just give you a talk about a little bit about uh, her. Uh, Ingrid is currently the head of product management at Gusto for core business and growth. Uh, she is a customer focused product leader dedicated, of course, to build some world class experiences uh, from the ground up. And when I say ground up, that involves, you know, like discovery of, uh, you know, market opportunities or emerging businesses, new revenue streams, and of course, more, more importantly, customer feedback. She is well-versed in data-driven and lean methodologies and also has a rich background in building both the B2B and B2C products. Previously, she held leadership roles at Uber, Shutterfly, Success Factors, and she also is an advisor at Mixpanel. Wow, some amazing organizations and uh, amazing products uh, widely used across. I mean, I can correlate myself with those using those products myself. 
as a head of product, uh, Ingrid enables uh, teams through uh, creation of clear and concise vision for the product, tying these project metrics to product goals and ultimately to the, to the business KPIs and financial targets of the company. Now, thus empowering, I mean, that inspires me as well, that, thus empowering her teams to make timely, accurate and effective trade-offs within their uh, focus area. Please welcome Ingrid Benadol. Well, hello everyone. Um, it is my pleasure to be with you tonight. Thank you so much Sandeep for the very warm welcome and for those great words. Um, I'm gonna try to um, share my screen um, yeah, so me. that you can see. Sure. Uh, before you do, I just want to like say, uh, you know, like I was reading one of your articles about the time you joined Gusto last year. Uh, one thing that I'm really curious to know, maybe outside of today's session, is how does it feel to have a customer of your own product at home in form of a, in form of your husband? Uh, do you get to hear issues, issues, and issues, or do you also get honest feedback? You know, sometimes. Uh, and let me tell you one more thing. As I was reading it, I just realized, you know, my cousin recently sent across some cookies from uh, the Bonjour Bakehouse. And it was truly amazing. And we just couldn't stop eating and finishing in no time, of course. Uh, thank you very much for that. <laughs> this is awesome. This is such a funny story. So, yes, my husband is a pastry chef. He's also an executive chef and he has a company um, and actually he's one of the main reason I joined Gusto um, as you were saying he is a customer of Gusto and about six years ago um, he came to me and he was like oh my god I love my payroll software and I'm like wait wait what you what my pastry husband my pastry chef of a husband loves his payroll software okay there is something really weird um, and so that's when I discovered Gusto and it's actually great to have to have him at home being a customer because that's one of the biggest difference I think between B2B and B2C. Um, it's the ability to understand customers because you are not a customer. And so when you're a payroll provider, it's not really easy to all of a sudden become a customer. It's like, oh yeah, let me just create my company and start paying someone, <laughs> um, you know, as a side hustle um, in the evening. So um, it's great to have him. He's giving me great feedback um, and being able to see him is, is really awesome. So um, that um, brought me to an idea that we have at Gusto. Uh, we'll see if we're doing it, uh, which is the idea of uh, adopt a customer. Um, and we're saying if every product manager is adopting a customer, um, then they will be able to really bring in the understanding, deeper understanding of uh, what our customer really need um, and think about new products, think about new way of doing things. So it is that's a good probably thing. the first that's probably the first takeaway for this today's session as well. I mean, if you're not married, I mean, and if you're aspiring product <laughs> manager, marry somebody who could be your customer. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> Choose wisely. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, we'll have, of course, Q&A towards the end of the session. Please post your questions uh, on the uh, respective uh, links and uh, uh, channels that Shama described already. And over to you. Welcome once again, Ingrid. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Sandeep. Thank you. All right, everyone. So hopefully you can see my screen by now um, and uh, my presentation. Um, so today we're all going to talk about. Ingrid, we cannot see your screen. I'm not, sorry. Not yet. Cannot yeah. see my screen. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Why is that? Yeah. Now we can. Now we can. Yeah. And you see all my screen or you see just my presentation? Uh, just your presentation. Okay, awesome. I have two screens. So I just want to make sure that you have the right screen and not the one that, has, that is full of windows. Okay, perfect. So um, today we're going to talk all about uh, data. Data using used across the product life cycle. The product life cycle is um, a long process, a very long process, especially when you start from the ground up. Um, and before we start, usually um, I go in and present myself, but Sandeep did a really good job at it, so I don't need to go through this. Um, so I'm going to go directly to the meat of our presentation today. 
So three takes away from this presentation, I like to say it right away so that you know what to expect and you know what to think about it. Um, so the first one is each step of the product journey has specific data needs. Um, it's not one size fits all, as Sandeep was saying, um, and it's very different depending on the step of your data, uh, your product life cycle. The second one is fact-based decision-making is more efficient than opinion-based decision-making. It's a bit harder, but it's worth um, the more the difficult steps to get there, and you'll know why very soon. And the third one that we talked about a lot is that being, being data-driven is good, is actually great. Um, being data-informed is even better. So with that, we're gonna go in to our first topic, which is each step of the product journey has specific data. And before we start, I would like to remind my people about something that is very dear and near to my heart. If you've seen my, uh, my presentation, you've seen that I've lived in Japan for a few years, and I actually love this uh, Japanese proverb, which means that vision without execution is a daydream. Execution without vision is a nightmare. And I'm pretty sure you've all been there. You've all, you know, starting doing things and you're like, yeah, let's do it, let's do it. And then, you know, you're in the, the mud, you're in the trenches and then you're like, oh my God, what are we doing? What's happening? It's not working. Well, that's because we kind of lack the vision part. Um, of what's happening. So with that in mind, um, the product journey is not roadmap execution ship, is a little bit longer. If you think about, you know, product journey, okay, you have first the product vision, then you go into a product strategy, then you go to your product roadmap, then you go into execution, and then you go to ship, right? All good, all great, we ship, yeah, we're good. Well, no, shipping is not the end of your product journey. Shipping is almost the beginning of your product journey when you are data-oriented. What you want is you want to have execution and ship and then measure and learn. And why is it important to have measure and learn? It is extremely important because then you can start to have tactical loops or aspirational loops. So when you think now of your product journey, you have the first steps that are what we call aspirational, the product vision and the product strategy. And then you have what we call is tactical, the product roadmap, execution, ship, measure, and learn. We stand of feedback loops. And that's what is really important. And then when you're, what you're measuring and you're learning is so important and is so groundbreaking, it can change your aspiration. And it should change your aspiration when it happens. So it's all good, but it's a bit hard to understand. So let's go around each of these steps one by one and see what do we mean by product vision and product strategy. Because I would love to know of all of you, who knows the difference between a vision and a strategy? Who is kind of marquee? Who is actually using those interchangeably when actually they shouldn't be the same? Product vision. So product vision, as we talked about, is aspirational, right? And it's something that is long enough and clear and concisely convey the high level purpose of the product or the business, depending on how, you know, where you are at your level. You can have a product vision or a company vision, depending on where you are, that is, you know, as big or as wide um, or as narrow as what you're working on. It describes the resultant experience, not how it works. That is also super important because if you're starting with your product vision, defining how it's going to work, how can you pivot? How can you change? How can you learn and change the way you are going to achieve this vision? And then it focuses on the outcomes after the work is done. It's not about, you know, I'm gonna build this great product or I'm gonna be able to create this great marketplace. No, no, it's what do you bring to your customer? What do you bring to the world as your product is being released? And so when we're thinking about product vision and that you have your product vision, what kind of metric do you need? Because each of the step of the product cycle, remember, is linked to a data need that is very different. 
Now, the product vision is linked to the North Star. The North Star is supposed to be the aspirational metric that you really want to make true and that will define the success of your company. And when we say it will define the success of the company, it's more like the North Star is here to be able to measure and understand your progress towards your vision. Now that you have your product vision and you know where you want to go, you, you need kind of a strategy, right? So that's the second step. The strategy is more specific than the product vision, but still light in detail because you still need to be able to change and adapt. It converts the fundamentals, audience, problem, solution, monetization, right? Those are all important. Right. Be really, really careful when you start and say, well, we're just going to see if a customer really wants it and likes it without thinking about monetization. We can think about monetization later. Yeah. But you need to understand if people are ready to pay for these products. Right. So think about it all holistically and understand. So how those steps are going to help you achieve your vision. Now, the product strategy has a different data, data need, as we talked about, and it's product goals. So you think of your North Star, okay, that's what represents success for a company, our ultimate goal. And then we have our product goals. And our product goals are going to be business representation of how we're doing thanks to our product that we are releasing. Now that's aspirational. When we say aspirational, we think like two, three, five years. You know, it's supposed to be a long journey to get there. It's supposed to give you room to change, adapt, pivot, and, and modify, right? Once you have your product strategy, now you move into the product roadmap. Product roadmap, much more concrete. We're arriving into tactical zone. Tactical zone means that that's what you're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. Your roadmap is what is going to help you succeed. You need to have high-level steps required to build the product. It meets the requirements of the product strategy. That's super important. Don't build a vision and a strategy and then don't look at it. You know, oh, I don't need to look at it. I need to focus on my roadmap. Well, but your roadmap is what is going to help you get to your product strategy and to your product vision. And as we were saying, everything on your roadmap should tie back to your product strategy and goals. Super important. The other thing that is really interesting with product roadmap is how you create it. Right. You can create a product roadmap that is like a one year, two years product roadmap, and then you go on an execution spree on your product roadmap. And you may or may not fit your client needs. One of the things that I prefer to do is what we call a rolling roadmap. And a rolling roadmap is usually, I usually go on a one year ro product roadmap and that is quarterly based. What it means, it means it's a just in time roadmap. The first quarter, the one that is just next to you, is the one that is the best defined. That's the one that you have the most information on. That's the one you're most sure of. And the other quarter in your rolling roadmap are the one that you're the least likely to know about, right? And that should be informed with what you're doing in the quarter that you're in. So every time you're in, you should have a rolling one-year roadmap that is from the most informed to the least informed. Now, what are the metrics that you need during your product roadmap? Hypothesis and potential. What does that mean? That means that everything that you put on your roadmap should be based on hypotheses that are to, meant to be validated or invalidated. And then what are the potential of those hypotheses? This is super important. I've seen many, many teams that are working in hypotheses that are actually facts. Like, and one of the hypotheses that I love, if a customer love a product better, they gonna churn less. Yeah, okay. Well, we don't need to validate this. We know that's for that's true, right? So let's make sure that when you make an hypothesis, it is a real hypothesis and you don't know if it's gonna be true or false and you need to validate it. And the potential is that when you have a project, you do back of the envelope understanding of how much this project could potentially impact your product goals, right? Super important. Now, third, uh, fourth one. <laughs> I don't know how to go. It's very early for me. Um, execution and ship. Remember, we put execution and ship together, right? What do we need to do? We need everyone involved in the inception, elaboration, execution to understand the user needs and 
business goals that are defining your product roadmap and your hypothesis and criteria. You need to ensure that what's being built meets the requirements and expectation of the markets and the customer. Always think about your customer. Always think about your market. Don't just think about your product. It's not because it's great for your product that it's going to be awesome for your customers. And define, clarify, and validate that the work being done will achieve the intended goals of the project. Sometimes we fall in love with our ideas and then we forget why we started to do something. And that's when we start to spend so much effort and so much ROI into something that will not yield to business impact. So always remember your intended goals and projects. And so what are the metrics associated to this one? It's success criteria. You know what is the metric that you want to move and you know but based on your back of the envelope, your potential, remember, how much you want to move it. And that is going to define your success criteria and will be able to help you understand if you're successful or not. And that's where the last step is so important. So do not, please do not stop at ship. That's the worst, is measure and learn. Measure and learn, why is it important? Because product analytics gathered after ship brings you all the learning opportunities that you need. That's when products are instrumented properly, that is. So really think about when you're shipping, is my product or my feature or my functionality instrumented properly? Can I understand what is happening with my customers, with my product and with my metrics? And look at it and understand it, deep understanding. Because the connection, causation and correlation can all be used to understand which behavior drive key metrics. So that's when you really start to think about your metric and you're like, what do I learn? What do I see, right? If you start to only use intuition on a shipped product or a ship functionality, you're missing out, right? And as we talked about, remember the little arrows that we wear, the feedback loops, right? Learnings need to inform your roadmap and sometimes your strategy because they're so important, right? And so, of course, for these steps, the data needs are metrics and tracking, hard facts. So that's a lot. That's a lot of information uh, that we went through. Um, but I give you a cheat sheet. So if there is one you know, slide that you want to copy paste, it's this one. Do not use it without my permission. But it's a great cheat sheet. It has all the different parts of the um, product roadmap. As we remember, we start with aspiration. We go for the product vision. We go into product strategy, right? And then we move into tactical. Don't move into tactical before you've done your inspiration and you're all aligned on your inspiration, aspirations. Right? And then you move to roadmap, execution and shape, and measure and learn. Please think about me when you do measure and learn. You're going to see it's awesome. It's amazing. And do not stop at shipping. You don't get brownie point for shipping. You get points for improving the business impact. All right, so now that we're here, let's move on to our second point, which is fact-based decision-making is way more efficient than opinion-based. Why is it? It's not necessarily for the result um, that you're gonna get. It's more about all the rest of your organization. You're not working alone. You need to bring in your village with you, right? And so as my dear friend, Jeff Bezos, which I have never met, so to be honest, um, is the great thing about fact-based decision is that they overrule the hierarchy. That's what is so important with fact-based decision-making. Much harder to start to say, no, I don't think you're right, right? Well, if it's a fact-based information, there is no right or wrong, it is the truth. Your interpretation might be wrong, but the fact and the data is the truth. Whereas when you come in in the morning um, and you might see that all my presentation is in pink, there is a reason. It's because there is this you know, funny thing that you, you hear like, well, the product manager came in this morning and said that everything in pink would be so much better for our customers. So we're just gonna change everything pink. Well, no, 
right? You don't get to wake up in the morning, brush your teeth as a product manager and say, well, I got Eureka, I got this great idea. And we're going to do this this way because, you know, that's what I dreamt of. No, we need data to be able to bring along our village, which is everybody in the organization. So how do we do that? Remember all the different data points that we have? Well, there are different types of data as we talked about. And we have what we call input and output metrics. And that's what we're using to inform our roadmap projects. Now, what is the difference are you going to tell me between an input and an output metric? That's a big, you know, weird concept. Well, the output metric is really what represents the result and what you're aiming for. Remember your North Star metric, right? Your product goals. Well, those are output metrics. The output metric is usually, because of that, is more aspirational. So it's going to do more, you know, towards your long term goals, as we talked about. Remember, aspirational. And it's going to show you the growth of your business. Now it's great, but you cannot touch and move directly your output metric. That's not how it works. You need then to define your input metrics. And what are those input metrics? They are what represents the action that influence your output metric. Right? An output metric, just to give you ideas, is a metric that, you know, as we talked about, growth and health of your business. So you can think about well, I need to reach 6 million in revenue. I need to, or another one, which is, I need to reach 100,000 weekly active users, or um, I need to reach 10 million in MR. Um, so those are good example of an output metric, right? But as you can see, you cannot really create functionality that will directly do this. Now, if you think about, for example, the weekly active metric, we're like, okay, so how can I do this? Well, that's when you get input metric. And those input metrics are what is driving the output metric. An example would be, I need 10,000 page views. I need 1,200 registration. I need seven upgrades from free to paid. Those are great example of input metrics, right? You can't exclusively focus on output metrics because they're too big, too broad, non-actionable. There are your scorecard. There are what you're aiming for. To win the game, you need to focus on the individual plays that are going to drive the score. And you need to understand how your metric, your tree of metric is working. So you need to monitor your output metric to know how you're doing. That's your long-term goal. You need to know it. You need to own it. You need to understand it. But you need to build experiments and functionality around the input metric that you can directly influence and that you can then see how you're doing with um, your metrics. With that in mind, that's when you go into iteration loop, right? So you choose a metric that you wanna move, right? And now you start iteration. Why is it important to do this? So you must be aware of the feedback loop, right? That is super important, all capital case. Boom. You need to build an experiment. You need to understand what are your goals and your outcome that you want. You need to know your baseline, meaning where are you right now, so that you understand if you're making progress or not. Then you're shipping, and then you're looking. You're measuring, and you have your metrics. Then you analyze this, you're like, okay, so it's great. I have metrics, I have all this information. What do I do with it? I analyze it, what does that mean? What are my user doing? Where are they getting stuck? What is happening between this step and this step? I see all my people coming in and signing up and then they're not going to the next phase. What is happening? Is my button not big enough? Um, don't they see it? Dang, they're all on mobile and the, the button for the next step is on the next page. Okay, that's when you analyze it. And then you learn and you take action. And some of the action are to pivot, some of the action are to preserve, some of the action are to change, and some of the action are to drop. And that's you need to be ready for. 
And that's why it's so important to have hypotheses and get be proven and disproven. And sometimes your hypotheses are going to be disproven, but you know what? If you fail fast, it's not a problem. It's actually a win because you've been able to understand something that you really thought was a great idea because of the data and the information and the analysis that you've made is actually not making any progress to where you want to be. And so you don't need to spend resources on this. So as we said, before spending a lot of resources, leverage extensive testing and incremental development to determine whether an idea has value. And also be sure that your first attempt will never be the best one because you don't know everything. You cannot know everything, even if you have the greatest team. You need to learn and understand what is the best for your customer. And what is the best for your customer is not necessarily what is the best for you. All right. So a lot of things. What is super important as we talked about in this space is your input and your output metric and how they relate to each other, right? If you think about your output metrics, think about all the way you can influence your output metric and then all the way you can influence those, those first level metrics and then all the way you can influence those second level metrics. And there, if you think about your, your metric, right? And your metric tree, you will start to see the level of metrics. You have your output metric, North Star, output metric, level one, level two, level three. And then your roadmap need to be tied to all those level one, two, three metrics. Remember, what do you wanna change? And that's also, so when you're gonna realize that you have so many ways to impact your output metric and you need to choose which one you're gonna go after because you cannot go after all of them. All right. One of the things that we didn't talk about in the previous um, slide, which I think is important is one of the things that you may or may not have noticed in this slide is that some of the arrows are solid and some are dashed, right? And you're like, okay, well, she was in a hurry to create her slide and she didn't realize that uh, she was making different arrows. Well, actually, no. There is a difference between those two. And what are those? The solid lines are the ones that are known facts. We know for a fact that if I change input metric one, it will move input metric two. Direct correlation between those two metrics. If I have more user listening to Spotify, I will increase the number of hours that music is played on Spotify. But the dashed ones are where we're creating a leap of faith. And the leap of faith is a, a relation between two metrics that we cannot really measure for sure because it's super hard to measure. It's super, there are so many things that are happening between those two metrics, but we have a very, very strong sense of correlation and we're taking a leap of faith. For example, if I can bring in more driver on the Uber platform, I will have more driving hours. That's true most of the time. Um, but will I have enough driving hour? I don't know. So let's make sure that we understand the difference between those solid lines and those dash lines, because you will understand why it's so important when we move to our third bucket, which is being data driven is good, being data informed is better. So today, you know, data is commonly understood as an invaluable resources of information that really can enable businesses to make the right decision. I think we 
all in agreement that without data, it's much, much harder to make a sound business and to take the right business decision. And more and more people, more and more corporations, more and more organization really want to have the data at the core of the decision making because I understand the benefit of it. So that's great. That's a great first step. But actually, the big caveat is how data is used in a decision making also matters. It can have an impact on the business and its trajectory. So it's great to have all this, it's great to have all this data, but now you need to understand how you're supposed to use this data. Famous quote by Oren Harari. The electric light did not come from the continuous improvement of candles. Now you can improve all the candles that you want, you will never get to electricity. Now it's the same user problem. I need to be able to see through the night. I need to see when there is no light, right? That's the same output. That's the same business goal. But one will get you to great, great, great candles that are burning slowly and that have a bigger flame. The other one is a breakthrough and an innovation. How do you get there? Ooh, $1,000 question. You have three ways of using data. Three right now that we define in the, in the industry. And the first one is being data-driven. The second one is being data-informed. And the third one is being data-inspired. What is the difference? The first one that is the most commonly understood is being data-driven. What does that mean? That means that you answer a specific question with the exact data or definitive number that you need to take this decision. Solid line between two, two data points or two metrics are being data-driven. So when do you use this? It's super valuable. That means that you know and you understand the data that you have and you understand it. And so you can make incremental changes, for example, an improvement on an already existing product or functionality. You ship the functionality, you're going to improve it. That's being data-driven. You understand it, you have all your product analytics, and you're able to make incremental changes. That's direct line of sight. I understand my drop rates, and I am able to define them, and I am able to improve them. It's also great when you've shipped something, as we talked about, you have hypothesis. How do you validate your hypothesis and assumption? Well, you run an A-B test and you understand. Is it true? Is it false? And it's also, hopefully, the best way to answer business questions. Do not <laughs> answer business questions on assumptions, right? And also ensure that your changes, if you remember what we talked about, the roadmap needs to lead to, you know, understand the product strategy and the product vision, and they need to feed it. It's also the way to understand that your product won't negatively impact your business. Data-driven, super important. You need to have your data, you need to understand it, you need to use it, you need to leverage it, and you need to constantly improve your product. But as we were saying, that's an improvement of the candle. How do you go to the electricity? Well, that's where you are data informed, right? What does that mean? That means that you put a story together by transporting a few data sources in order to inform new tactical decision. Now, that means that you understand all the points that you're using as being data-driven and you're able to put them all together and understand the correlation and be able then to make assumption based on the data that you have informed by all these data points. When do you use it? You use it to refine and inform future strategies by understanding past failures and successes. Remember, you were data-driven, you have all those failures and successes, now you can understand trends, it can inform your strategies. It helps you to understand trends when trying to come up with big bold bets or new product ideas, right? That is informing the way you're thinking because the more you're data-driven, the more you understand what you've been doing, 
the more you will be able to make assumptions that are validated based on previous information and previous knowledge that you can translate into new areas or new um, way of thinking. And then the third one is obviously using a hypothesis driven approach to explain why you think a strategy will work. It's a big, big loop as we talked about. All right, I'm gonna try to go much, much faster for the rest. Being data inspired is the next step. And this one is you are starting to use your intuition and inference to identify seemingly unrelated data sources to inspire new ideas. Well, that's a mouthful. But that is super interesting is that now you understand data driven, you understand your data, you're able to go into data informed now you have so much access to so many informations and inspiration that you can be data inspired. And that's what you use when you're trying to understand, for example, concurrent trends during a strategy phase. You're trying to make the strategy of a company. You need to understand all those different trends and that needs to help you identify, identify potential direction of a product because you understand all those trends. It's great for design thinking when you're trying to come up with new ideas, be informed about and inspired by all those data trends and the data information. Great for brainstorming and use as a springboard for ideation and innovation. So if we summarize all this, if you're looking to validate, be data driven, if you're looking to innovate, be data informed. If you're looking for inspiration, be data inspired. So it takes away, remember, the first one is each step of a product journey has specific data needs. Second, fact-based decision-making is more efficient than opinion-based. So make yourself a favor be fact-based decision-making. And third, being data-driven is good, but being data-informed is better. Otherwise, you will never create electricity. You will always improve your candle. And with that, I wanted to, to leave a little, bit of space for, a little bit of space for all your Q&A. So please, let's go to your Q&A. Wow, I love those minions though, <laughs> always. Uh, thank you, thank you, Ingrid. There's so many questions coming in. Thank you all participants for uh, being able to uh, make it so interactive and, you know, like uh, have so many questions pouring in. I'm having a little time to, uh, you know, uh, uh, process and pick, up, pick out a few things. I'm sorry if I couldn't pick out some of these questions here, but uh, I'm trying to pick out some of the relevant questions to this topic and to this discussion today. Uh, firstly, um, you talked about uh, product strategy and the journey as such, uh, Ingrid. So there's a question here, what role does uh, you know, uh, uh, in, uh, the following play while building product data strategy, build versus buy or you know, on-prem and cloud, uh, open source versus you know, being commercially available, and uh, you know something like security and compliance. Uh, what role do these play while building uh, the product strategies? Yeah, that's a great question. So if you think about what we were talking about, you know, you have your your aspiration, you have your output metric, right? Your output metric is what you really think about. It's like I want to reach six million in revenue by having a margin of eighty percent, right? Well, that's what you need to think about and you just need to make your tree the same way that you do for when you're creating a product. So if you're looking at M&A, you're going to say, okay, so what is the best way for me to increase our revenue? Well, the best way for us to increase our revenue might be to increase the number of products that we have on the market is to extend our time or total addressable market. So we need to bring in new functionality. In order to do that at 80% margin, I need to do it in a way that is more sustainable meaning that I want to have it um, that is costing me less, right? That's when you start to think build, buy, um, or adopt, right? And so that's the exact same way. So in our m and strategy, your m and strategy is here to understand or to help you accelerate 
the reach to your output metric. If it's not letting you accelerate, then why would you do it, right? And so exact same way as, you, as using your, your, your metrics throughout uh, the different cycle, and that's just hypothesis, right? Okay, great. Uh, so let me, uh, I think there's, uh, there's so many questions on metrics. So I'll just quickly jump onto that before we uh, lose out the time. I'll probably summarize uh, some of these uh, questions when put together uh, uh, one, as one single question. Uh, you know, are there uh, standard input metrics uh, which can be consumed or applicable for most of the products, you know, uh, or are they different for different categories of products? And, and uh, how do you understand, you know, which input metric is driving which output metric? Is there any kind of a correlation that we have to establish? And, and I think there is to just to add to this, uh, there are one. There's one more uh, participant asking if you could share some of the, uh, you know, some of your own experiences practically uh, as in in doing these things. Yeah. So it's it's funny because um, I really hesitated to to add a slide after the metric tree as an example, right? And. I actually didn't do it on purpose because I was afraid that if I give you an example, people are going to just reuse it blindly and apply it to <laughs> things that doesn't make sense. Um, and so because the metric tree will be extremely different based on what you're trying to accomplish. So we can very quickly take two examples. Um, one of them will be, uh, for example, at Shutterfly, I needed to add, um, have more people um, increase the number of um, photo-based product being printed. Okay, so that's my output. I need to basically increase our revenue, right? So if we think about, um, I need to reach, um, I was creating a new line of product. I need to reach 500 million of revenue in the first year. That's my output metric. How do I do that? I go in into my first line of metric. I need to create I need to enable people to create, um, our current user to create more photo book products. That's one way. Second way, I need to bring in more users to start creating new product. Okay, that's great, so second way. Third way, I need to bring back people that are no longer our customer to start creating again, resurrection. Okay, those are three ways. Now, if we go to the first one, you're saying, okay, making more product per user, how can I do that? Mm -hmm. Well, you can make it to improve your product path. Your product, the way you're creating product is just too complicated. You have a 55% drop rate in your product path, in your creation path, improve that. You can have, um, I need to inspire my user to create more products throughout the year. So I need to make, uh, different products that are based on the season. You can so, and you can see how it's it's you know feeding of each other. That's one way. That's e-commerce. If we go to Uber, where I was you know in charge of most of the driver product management, what do I do? I need to increase the number of hours driven on our platform. How do I do that? Same thing. I need to increase the number of driver of hours that each driver is doing on a weekly basis. That's one way. I need to increase the number of drivers that are coming into our platform, the new acquisition. I need to make the driver that are here stay longer, prevention of churn. I need to make sure that I bring back drivers that have stopped driving, resurrection, right? And then each of those, how do I do that, right? So that's how you create your metric tree, and there are direct correlation with some of them. And as we were saying, there are leap of faith with others. If I create seasonal product for Shutterfly, I may or may not increase the number of products that a customer are doing throughout the year. So that's that's more about metrics, you know. Like I I, I think I had uh, my own question as well, but I would probably like to uh, bring in some of the audience question here, which is probably related to what my question was. Uh, what are the metrics uh, to measure, uh, you know, the product vision and strategy? You know, like, uh, is do you want to suggest, okay, we, we understand uh, there are metrics for the, 
um, the end product as such, but how do we measure the product vision and strategy as such? So the product vision and strategy, as we talked about, have two things that are super important that will measure success. The first one is, are you able to define what is your now star metric? This is your ultimate output metric, right? Is this the right one? Is this really what you wanna go after? Based on the, pro the, the, fun the business that is right now. If you have a business that have not found product market fit, you need your North Star metric to be about product market fit. If you have a product that is that I found product market fit, it's about growth. So you need your North Star metric to be about growth, right? And the other one that we talked about is aspirational. And the mm. biggest reason why you're doing vision and, and, and strategy, remember, is to bring along your, journey, your, your village, right? So you need the biggest way to see if it's a great vision and strategy is how are we able to bring in and to convince people around the company that this is what we need to do and that it's aspiring, inspiring them and that it's making everyone roll in the same direction. If you don't have that, everybody is gonna roll in their own direction. Oh, you might roll in the same direction, but you're all on different paths and that you're not helping each other. But when you have a great vision and strategy, everybody buys into it and they take it, grab it as a bone and never let go. That means that everyone is going to try to go in that direction. That's when you have a great a winning vision and strategy. And then you don't need to micromanage each of those teams. You know they're gonna do the right thing for your product. Yeah, if I could just follow up on that, you know, and, and take to the next level of, you know, from the product vision and strategy, uh, you know, uh, coming to the quantification of data itself, you know, uh, uh, do you, have you had any experiences talking about quant how do you quantify the data itself? In other words, uh, like how much of data is good enough? <laughs> <laughs> no amount of data is good enough that's me i'm a data geek i need more data every day um but you shouldn't have data for the sake of data you need to understand what is your goal again to make sure that the most the most important data is the one that it will be able to help you measure and understand what you're trying to achieve and so that's the product analytics on one side. You need two really big group of data. You need the business metrics and you need the product metrics. And the business metrics are what is helping you to understand if your business is sound. You need to understand the number of revenue. You need to understand the number of ads. You need to understand the number of a daily, weekly, monthly user, depending on what you're doing. It's the number of your margins. It's how much you know, you're spending, et cetera. Those are your business metric. You need to run your, your um, your product and your company on sounds ground. Understand that. And then your product metrics are the one that you're tracking, right? When you're doing something, you need to really understand what is happening. Enough metric there means that you understand everything that you've shipped and the journey of your customer and understand where you have problems. Where are your drop rates? Where, what, how, how long do they take? All those things are super important. Where do they click? What's the path that they're taking? And then you will be able to understand, can I simplify, accelerate, decrease the, the drop rate? So those are the two big buckets of data. You need to have both of them. And think about one of the things that I hear is that, well, we're not big enough to need really product-based um, metrics. We, we'll do that you know, when we're bigger. Well, how do you learn if you do that? And then let me tell you, it's gonna be really hard later to bring that in. Absolutely, that's the dilemma uh, all, all of us in product world face. Um, let me just quickly, you talked about uh, uh, fact-based decisions and opinion-based decisions. You know, uh, if you could probably give some example, you know, from your own experience or the things that you've come across, both from a B2C perspective and a B2B perspective, uh, that would be good. Sure. All right. I'm going to try to, to come up with, uh, with some. Usually the opinion base uh, start with trust me at all. Um, trust me 
if we are um, if we are what can I say providing more um, incentives to our driver um, they're going to come back and you're like okay yeah well that's fact based um, why do you say that um, well, because they want to earn more money. So if I bring in more incentives, they're going to earn more money. So they're more likely to come back. Okay, really? And how do we know it's uh, sound business wise? How much in improvement are you going to make? I don't know. I don't know. But I think it's a great idea. Let's do it. Okay, now you take the fact based decision making is all right, so we've run um, three uh, incentive programs for our drivers uh, that I've churned. Um, and we found that uh, when we spend at least $100 uh, per month on driver that have not been driving for more than three months, uh, we bring back about 10% of them. Okay, yeah. how, how many hours are you bringing them back in? Well, they usually come back and drive two hours. Okay, so now let's understand. So how much does that make? You know, what is the cost of acquisition for those driver? Too high, okay. So now we need to make a test to see, okay, great, let's do this. Let's make a test to see if we can bring back drivers for less and if it's as efficient. How do you do that? That's fact-based. The other one is um, more opinion-based. Hey. Uh, I know we are at the top of the hour, but uh, uh, but I just want to take one last question here. Uh, I know there are so many questions pouring in, Ingrid. I mean, like this has this has probably been a truly amazing session here. But just one last question, if I may: uh, What is the difference between objectives and goals? Are they the same? Uh, goals are, you know, uh, output of strategy, and key results are output of execution. Is that is that correct? Okay, can you repeat the question? What is the difference between? Objectives and goals, are they the same? Uh, do you consider goals as output of strategy and key results as output of execution? Yes, so it's very, yeah. So you're thinking about the OKR framework, great framework, by the way, love it. Um, so yes, objectives and goals are very similar. Um, the difference, though, is that usually your objectives are more on your roadmap. So OKR are more at the roadmap level. Um, and then your goals um, are more at the aspiration level. Um, so in the case of, for example, you're trying to increase the revenue of your company. Okay, so that's going to be your goal. Your objective might be this year, I will increase the revenue by 100 million. And my key results are going to be the way that we're going to do that. So in order to do that, I'm going to add 20% more user. I'm going to reduce my churn by 5%. And I'm going to increase the amount of freemium to premium uh, by 10%. So they're very similar. Um, the goals are more um, aspirational and longer term. And the, the objectives are those numbers, but uh, apply to your cycle. So to your yearly roadmap, if you have a yearly roadmap. And your key results are how you're gonna get there. So that's part of your assumptions and your hypothesis driven and your success criteria. Very same, same, same way of doing the things, just different names. Sure. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Ingrid, for, for a very thought-provoking talk. Uh, you know, all great things must definitely come to an end, uh, but this is, of course, not the end to, for our collaboration. Uh, we have so many questions pouring in. Uh, there are still participants on. Uh, thank you very much, audience, as well. Uh, I'm sure our audience, of course, had several points to take away, uh, but I would probably like to summarize with uh, uh, three simple points here. One is... Uh, you know, uh, different ways to approach the product journey, you know, that aspirational and tactical, that's a new uh, lens to look at how the product journey is and uh, how to connect input and output metrics in the entire journey of the product life cycle. Uh, and of course, the third point that I had was, you know, 
uh, differences between the data driven and data informed and to my surprise you just coined a new word data inspired as well today uh, thank you very much and of course thank you also for sharing timely and relevant quotes i could notice similar comments on the chat window here on the zoom as well um, so on that note i i thank you once again for this wonderful session uh, and of course uh, on uh, a big thanks to all those who have joined today's session don't forget to tune in tomorrow and through the rest of this week for similar awesome sessions.